Hey, everybody, and welcome back to a new episode of the Hemmings Hot Rod Barbecue Podcast. On this episode, we have Mark Trossel, the head of Ram Truck and Mopar Exterior Design for Stellantis. Now, I have known Mark. I've known Mark. I've known you for a lot of years now. Yeah. And uh, one of my favorite people in the industry, one of the best designers I've ever seen, a dyed-in-the-wool, passionate car guy. And it's it's so good to talk to you, man. I haven't seen you in a while. How, how you been doing? Doing good. Thanks for that introduction. Much, much appreciated very much, but I'm doing great. And it's always good to talk to you. I always, uh, always enjoy talking cars with you. Ah, uh, dude, it's, it's always fun. So your title, head of Ram truck and Mopar exterior design. Okay. So I'm just going to ask you so you could explain to everybody, what does that mean? What do you do? <laughs> like, like, because it's when you're the head of something you oversee, but how, like, give us the profile of, of what the scope of your job is. Yeah. So, I mean, and I've had, I'll give you a little bit, even more background. I've, I've yeah. had an you know, awesome career um, in automotive design. Absolutely. You know, dream job since I was a kid. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time always been at this company. This company's had multiple names, um, starting when I hired in at Chrysler back in 1992. You know, we've, we've evolved through a few different places. Still, the passionates are here. Um, and, uh, you know, my most recently, um, you know, and that's where I got to got to know you real well was, you know, I led um, I led Dodge and SRT design mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of years, uh, as well as Chrysler design. Um, so, you know, my, my, my car passion got to come through in, uh, in some of those products, which I, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit. And then, yep. uh, yeah, most recently, um, I took over uh, Ram truck design as well. And then I have Mopar uh, also, which is kind of like the candy shop of, of <laughs> the job where, you know, I get to do the SEMA builds that we do. Uh, a lot of the Moab uh, Easter Jeep Safari yep. vehicles that we do. So I get to play in the performance side of things with that. So it's really a job uh, that I love. And I, I don't like to talk about it too much because I don't want to get found out. But <laughs> 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 well, you've been so 90. So it's, it's been 30 years. I know. I know. That's insane, Mark. That I mean, did you ever think that when you started in 92, 30 years later, you you'd be where you are doing this and still enjoying it. Be one of the old guys is what I am now. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Yeah. You know, it, it was yeah, going through school, you know, going through college. It was like, Oh, you know, you, you know, I looked up to these, you know, these idols and, you know, Tom Gales and all these amazing, uh, you know, car designers. And um, now to be, you know, having the ability to affect design and the automobile and vehicles that I see on the road, you know, yeah. every decision I make, it's, it's, it's kind of a pinch me thing. It, it really is, but it's crazy how quick it goes by. And, you know, the life cycle of a car, you know, development of a car is, you know, four or five years. So, you know, right. it's, it's this constant churn of, you know, we're working, you know, five, six years in the future, which is, which is pretty cool. And I think that's probably why it goes by so quick. For me. Yeah. Well, that, that's a great point because like, when something is a, I don't know, say a 2022 model, right? Once that debuts, you'll already look at it. What's coming down the pike. You're already like the next generation or more into the evolution of whatever that platform is. No. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why, you know, there, I love nothing more. In fact, I was just telling someone uh, in the studio earlier, earlier today, I said, I love having some people come in the studio because we look at things every day and I'm like, oh, you know, all I see are problems and issues and things I want to change. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, people are seeing it. And when it gets introduced and it's on the road, they're seeing a the vehicle for the first time. And they're like, whoa. And I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah, you know, I'm tired, <laughs> of, I'm tired of looking at it, you know. And so it's cool to be able to live kind of through the eyes of a customer and the eyes of other passionates, you know, when they see things that we've been, you know, when I've been losing sleep over for the past four years. But, yeah, to your point, we – you know, we're already working on, you know, what's going to come out in, you know, another three years or so. So it's kind of cool. Well, I, I think, you know, for everybody else, I mean, being in the industry, I mean, I know how it works, but I, I you know, it's interesting when, when you can tell other people and they're like, they work on it that far in advance. I'm like, yeah, they, they have to. And I think that what, what people don't understand, I think when most people hear the term automotive designer, right, they immediately go back and they think of themselves when they were four years old and they were drawing some box thing on a piece of paper with some wheels and a big exhaust on it, right? Yep. And, but they have no idea 
how much more is encompassed in that job. So from, I mean, so could, if you wouldn't mind talking about that a little bit, because designing the exterior of an automobile is one thing, but there's a whole lot more to an automobile than just the way it looks, right? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, as designers, we, every line or every surface we, you know, is we're passionate about. And to your point, so you've got, you know, not only, you know, customer data and, and innovation that you're trying to put into a vehicle, um, obviously cost of a vehicle is huge. So yeah. we're constantly, <laughs> yeah. constantly having those, oh, I'll call them debates, not battles, it's debates. Um, and, you know, you have engineering, you know, the, the way a, a quarter panel looks on a vehicle, that has to be stamped if it's made out of metal. You know, there's stamping requirements. Then, you know, mm -hmm. there's the, just developing paint takes years because of the testing that goes into, you know, finishes. And if we're color matching a plastic part to a sheet metal part, there's time that right. has to go into that development. Plus, let alone, you know, the, the constant changing, you know, uh, requirements for crashing vehicles. Um, it's, it's, it's endless. It, it really is endless, uh, but it, but it keeps it exciting and it keeps it fun for sure. When, so when you started off as a designer, right. Um, when you look at the cars from say, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a show and I was like, there was a 50, a slammed 59 Cadillac. Right. And I'm looking at this thing with the fins and the, the lines and it, every part of that car is stunning. But at the same time, there are exterior parts of that car that if they hit you, they would literally kill you. They'd put, they'd put a hole in you in a minute. Right. Um, but at that time, it's like the designers really had just kind of free reign. They could develop these amazing shapes. And if they looked good enough, I feel like corporate was just like, yeah, man, do it. Yeah. Like that looks great. Yeah. So yeah. from a, a kind of a safety perspective and, and from an engineering perspective, do you think that was kind of like the heyday or what do you think the heyday of automotive design was where as a designer, you could have gone buck wild and there was a possibility that your image could actually make it to production? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think you nailed it, right? The, you know, the 50s era is just, you know, just style on style and style. And, you know, you could, you know, sheet metal was, you know, that thick where you could, you could <laughs> shape it any way you wanted or stamp it any way you wanted. And the, the amount of chrome and, you know, whatever you wanted, it, it was there. And so it's pretty cool that, that that era existed. And I love the fact that, you know, that you could see the influence through aircraft in their design. Yeah. You know, they were definitely emotional vehicles. And, and I love that, you know, nowadays, you know, weight is so important for, you know, efficiency of a vehicle and in all the factors. And so, you know, material thickness counts. We actually have, <laughs> it's your point about, you know, those vehicles could impale someone, you know, nowadays <laughs> we have pedestrian impact um, laws. And, and if we sell a vehicle in Europe, they're even more stringent than they are here. So, you know, radius is certain clearance between the hood and, and the top of an engine or a hard part. Right. Are all criteria that we have these days that uh, make it, you know, a lot, uh, a lot more challenging, I, I think, than, uh, than maybe it was in the past. And, and you know, the, the other thing is, I was always amazed at the turnover of the cars of the 50s and 60s. You know, it was oh my God, yeah. every year. It's like, oh, it's a new car. No, we changed Crazy. this. It's like, how do you do that? You know? <laughs> That that always that always blows me away. It used to be where it was like every every year something new came out, and on on like like I always go back to Chargers because I, I have them and I'm familiar with them. But like sixty eight, you know, taillights, grill, sixty nine, different grill, different tail, seventy, blah blah. And you're going, who's how are they doing this so quickly? Yeah. And how is the production speeding up that fast to be able to to keep up with demand? Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, I, you know, obviously they didn't have the criteria that that goes into things. You know, we change, you know, a headlamp and we have to retest the, you know, it, you right. know, injecting it into wall. So the criteria is is vastly different. But you're right. There's still an efficiency and a speed that they had. But let me ask you because, um, you know, through the years, right, Chrysler, Plymouth, Ram, from a a, a stylistic perspective. They have come out with cars on the street that you would be like, that's never going to be made. A perfect example for me is always the Prowler, yeah. right? I, I look at the Prowler and I'm like, there's no way that should have been a production car, right? With the exposed front suspension and the hot rod fenders and the whole, uh, you know, 
that how did like how does something like that come about because there's i don't think there's no way you could build that today right you couldn't do that today it'd be yeah it'd be tough for sure i think and and i you know i you're, you're absolutely right and that was um you know early days in my uh you know career here watching that vehicle come about and you know i give a lot of credit to the to the die hard car people that that ran the company and we still have those people here but yeah. you know tom you mentioned you know tom gale was a hot rodder you know he loved you know he did it you know outside of work and and then francois castang was the engineering guy and he was a car guy and so they you know, yeah. they put their heads together and they're like, how can we use this as a test bed? You know, with you know all the aluminum pieces that were exposed yep. on it and, and structural, and how can we make this niche type of a vehicle? And and I think that passion or that blood runs through the walls of this company in all of our products, whether it's a Wrangler or a Challenger, it's always trying to have a little different type of a spin or a hook on our vehicles. Uh, to appeal to a different customer. And, and I, I love that about this place. So, okay. So, you, I mean, now you're the head of, of Ram truck and, and Mopar exterior design, right? However, when you were doing SRT, you were playing with 800 horsepower challengers and chargers and, and doing like the real high-end performance stuff. Shifting over to the truck world, is it is it just as exciting or is it different going from these high end, like hardcore performance vehicles to designing more utilitarian style vehicles um, that really are functional and serve a purpose? Not to say that the performance stuff doesn't, but they're more hobbyist where like a pickup truck is a pickup truck. Like, you know what people are going to use. They're going to use it for everything. Right. Um, is it, is it, is the passion any different? Is the design any, any, like, how do you shift focus from super yeah. performance to utilitarian? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And, and, you know, the, one of the reasons why I really wanted to, um, immerse myself in, in the, the truck world and the Ram brand was because as a designer, as a, we're really an industrial designer, first and foremost, mm -hmm. and, and a product designer. So I love problem solving. I love, you know, design, no matter what type of vehicle it is, uh, and, and the thing about trucks, though, and whether it's 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 Stellantis, Ram, or you know our competitors, the yeah. truck segment, there are so many different types of customers because that tool of a pickup truck is used by people so many different ways. It can be used as the you know the, the construction, the tradesman, yep. all the way to a luxury. Someone just uses it because they love a truck, and so right. as a designer, I love that that I have all all these different people to try and reach and yeah. how to reach them in different ways and trx right there's an example that still yeah. have, we still have that that performance side of it that emotional side of it and and you know it's the the, the beauty about you know, you know the automobile is everybody loves buys a vehicle be, hopefully because of the way it looks in some way shape or form and so right. you know i still love being able to put that in there but it is a challenge for sure yeah i think you know, I think anybody, unless they're they're one hundred percent based on on price point, buying any vehicle, almost anything mechanized, is an emotional purchase, right? You, you look at it and you say, okay, well, what is this trigger in my mind? Does it make me feel a certain way? Does it make me want to act a certain way? Do I want public perception of me to reflect, you know, a certain way? And I think that is that's a big thing. And the pickup truck market, I mean, maybe it's mid 80s do, do you think that because it used to be where if you had a pickup truck you you were a landscaper you were a contractor you were this you were that nobody bought pickup trucks just to buy pickup trucks right yeah. where now there's it feels like there's a you know for every one in one in five driveways is a pickup truck yeah. right yeah exactly and most of them are all four doors on top of it right yeah which is crazy is. yeah exactly because you know, like you reference it's like 70s and 80s, I was like, yeah, two door pickup truck, it's a tool, you know, and now it's like, no, I need four doors. And I mean, they have amazing amounts of leg room and, you know, they still have big cargo and, you know, yeah, it's, it's crazy. So well, yeah. like when you guys, like when the Ram came out, the, this generation Ram, you guys redid the interior of that thing. I remember getting into that thing and being like, are you kidding me right now? Yeah. Because the interior was that of a full on luxury car. 
and better in in many aspects the way that the 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 screen was integrated and the way that it was very intuitive to use and the materials it has evolved to the point where you can go from a lexus or whatever your car bmw whatever the case is you can get into these trucks now and you're going well i'm not losing anything right i'm not losing functionality i'm not losing luxury and and in many cases you get more yeah you get more Absolutely, absolutely. It's like a beautiful living room on wheels. It, it, it is. It is absolutely true. And and that's what I. That's the challenge I love is how do you you know how do you do that far end, and then go the other way to still, you know, make a truck that's uh, a functional truck for for you know a company or an individual that uses it more as a tool. But how do you still? How do you still, you know, have those same elements, but make it more affordable on the other side of it and still functional at the same time? Right. I love that challenge. And then all those things in between too, you know. How has, I mean, now everything is going kind of a more eco-friendly route, right? Where EVs are kind of all over the place. They're going to continue. They're not going anywhere. They're here to stay. Um, everybody is very concerned about nature, about all, you know, all this other stuff. How does the organic side of it kind of fit into truck design? Meaning, do you look at elements from nature where these pickup trucks or these SUVs are going to be used? And the, and do you take some design elements from that? Like you 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 know mentioned a little earlier, like you get to play around with the the vehicles from like Easter Jeep Safari, like the SEMA cars and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Do do you look at nature every now and then and go, that's kind of cool? I think I you could. Know- I, we got, yeah, in a, and there's a couple different ways that, that I think the environment or, or nature affect our design. And, and for one, color, exterior color. Mm, sure. Um, I love that. You know, we talk about, you know, Easter Jeep Safari vehicles or whether it's a truck. I love trying to pick a color if it's a vehicle I know is, is that's going to be shown, say, somewhere in Utah that mm. will complement the backdrop. You know, I love that that side of it. So certainly we're influenced um, from that way of it. Um but, but the other side of it, you know, you mentioned, you know, battery electric vehicles and that, and to your point, yep, they're not going away, <laughs> they're, they're coming quickly. But, you know, how can we make a vehicle uh, more, sustain, more sustainable and, and looking at what are materials that we can use from nature mm. to, uh, you know, make it, how can we take recycled materials and make them an aesthetic piece, whether it's on an interior or even the exterior of a vehicle that, that is good for the environment um, and, and that customers appreciate that, you know, I think, you know, customers don't want it to be rammed down their throat, so to speak, you know, it wants to yeah. still um, have the appeal um, and then that's an added bonus to it. So to me, it's, it's balancing those things and still giving our customer what they want. When you when you talk to the customers, and I know you guys do focus groups, and you and you know as enthusiasts, you kind of embed yourself into, um, kind of into that world. I know myself, like every weekend, I'm somewhere, right? I'm I'm at a car show, I'm at a racetrack, I'm at a drag strip, I am somewhere where there are motor vehicles gathering, even if I go for lunch. Um, and it, you know, part of it is that I'm always talking to people. I'm like, what do you like about that? Just one, like I'm not a designer, I'm not anybody, but I look at stuff and I'm I'm always curious as to what elements they they enjoy about a vehicle. What yeah. what made you buy this? What and in my head is like a little automotive marketing company going on just to say, okay, well, why why do you like this? Um how important is that for for you to really entrench yourself with the enthusiast crowd? Um and how does that influence your decisions? Yeah, no, and, and that's, you know, I always say if, if and people are always like, oh, does the company make you be here this weekend? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm here on my own. And it's because yeah. I'm like you, I, I just, I love the culture. I love the automotive culture. And so I try and find out things that are going to be stimulating for me. Then the added bonus is that I can just be kind of low key and and talk to people and understand, you know, why why are you passionate about this or why did you modify yeah. this? What what did you like um, about this or that you changed it? And and I love that part of it. And and we've we've actually done some things um, going. And, and I know we're not the first. Um, we certainly won't be the last. But going to you know Home Depot or Lowe's parking lot mm-hmm. and just sitting in our vehicles. And observing how are people loading their trucks and vans, and even oh. in some cases, 
you know, what are they doing? And you, know, you see the craziest stuff, you know, in some cases, but, but how can we, you know, take that and create some kind of yeah. a neat function for it? So there's that kind of stealth side of it too, but certainly the, the, the enthusiast, the pure, you know, the car show side of it is always, you know, you'll always walk away learning something from those events. So is it cool for you when you see a product that you designed, whether it was a Charger, a Challenger, a Jeep, a Ram, whatever it is, is it cool when you see modifications, when people modify these? I'm sure there are cases where you'll look at it and be like, that's a mess. Like, what are you killing me right now? But I'm sure, but I'm, I'm assuming there are also cases where you look at somebody, you know, that's done a modification and be like, that's, that's, that's pretty cool. Like how, which, which, which category is the, is the bigger and the smaller? <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, cause there's times I'm just like, no, 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 <laughs> um, you know, but, but there are times where, you know, because, you know, simplicity in design, you know, simplicity, you know, is, is timeless. And, and, you know, so we, you know, when you see sometimes modifications that are very trendy and it's just, it's so, you know, jarring and over the top that you want to say, man, it's, it's, you know, it's not going to last that long. But you see some some subtle modifications and and things that are done to vehicles and they're like, man, yeah, that's so tasteful and it looks so good. And, yeah. and those are the things that I love to see. Right. It's just it's 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 very rewarding in that sense. So. All right. So based on that, there are companies out there that are reimagining vehicles, right? I'll use Singer as an example, right? They've taken a Porsche 911. They re they don't even call it a Porsche. It's just the, you sing it, reimagined by Singer, whatever the hell that means, right? Yep. Whatever. Yep. Um, you know, another company called Nardun just did a 928, which blew, I don't know if you saw it online, but oh my God, did it blow I me did. away. I did, yep. You know? yep. Was, oh my God, I was like, all right, how much? I don't have enough money, but I want one. Um, so what do you think of, of companies like that, that are taking these kind of older cars and perfect example, Ralph Gilles Charger, right? Yeah. And and really kind of taking that to that next level. Um, what is that something you would want to do as a designer? Do you applaud those companies? Do you oh, yeah. go, eh? I mean, what, what's your feeling? Yeah, I love. In fact, uh, to build on that, there was a, there was another company. I don't know the name. They did a P eighteen hundred, a Volvo P eighteen hundred. I know exactly who you're talking about. Yep. Oh, that car is so cool. I just like oh, it gives me goosebumps, and and because I, I love that that car anyway. Um, but but I love it. I love that, and I attribute like you know like Singer that the modern day, you know, modifications to these vehicles, Porsches, and things like that. We're talking about you know, to the original, you know, to a 32 Ford, right? I mean, that was like the original hot rod. Right, but, right, but right. But 32 right. Ford, how car guys know it, isn't really like how the car came, you know? Right. You know like, <laughs> Literally nothing like yeah, it. Yeah, right? right. The fenders came off, right? I mean, right. And, then, and then, you know, like, you know, the Don Spencer car, right? It's still, it's just timeless car with subtle modifications to it. Yeah. And it's just so cool. And so I look at, I look at, you know, the singer stuff and that is in the same way and like Ralph's car and some of the stuff that those guys are doing. It's just they're they're changing it, but it's just it's modernizing it enough without, you know, hitting it with a sledgehammer to, you know, actually, you know what? You see a lot of guys do very, very cool stuff on the exterior, but then the interior, they go crazy and the, yeah. the interior goes further than the exterior. Yeah. You yeah. lose that balance. But I to answer your question, I love that type of design. And I think, you know, the restraint that goes into those, um, some of them are just so successful and so time timeless. Um, I, I big respect for those guys for sure. I, I think it's really cool. And I think that, you know, it's interesting. A lot of time you'll see a modern or a custom car, right? Um, and sometimes they're, they nail it and sometimes they miss the mark. And I feel like when they miss the mark, I always want to know if the owner knows that. Be like, you got, you were this close, man. Like you got, you came so close <laughs> and then you crossed that line and made a hash out of it. We could bring it back, but oh, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, and I think the interior is, is a great example, right? I know that on like the speed core stuff, like Ralph's car, that interior on that vehicle. Um, and for those out there listening, Ralph Shiel, just built a, a, a 68 charger by speed core constructed at the interiors is completely bespoke. It's, it's unlike nothing I've ever seen. That is, I mean, that's artwork to me, yeah. Yeah. right? That is just, that's pure artwork. Um, 
But there's a cohesiveness that I think goes along. Most of the time you see people concentrate solely on the exterior and then the interior is crap. It's like, it's like, man, that's, you're not sitting on the outside of the car. You're sitting on the inside of the car. Yep. Yep. So did you like, what happened? Yeah, I'm with you. That co- that's a key word, right? Cohesiveness, you know, and, and it's, uh, that's what creates that timelessness and, you know, just you know, things that are, that, that complement each other. And it, yeah, I, I love what you said though. <laughs> yeah. It's like, do you, do you know that you were this close? You know, I, I love, you know, I, I love walking around shows and it's like, you know, walking around with other car designers, it's the worst thing in the world. Cause you know, we just, everything we want to change or, or, you know, tweak this and, or uh, help someone out, you know, but uh, <laughs> Yeah, they, they get so close and then they cross that line and you just like face palm. You're like, oh, my man. Yeah, yeah. Like, and you don't want to like, I don't know. I mean, it's not your place to say anything or my place to say anything yeah. because to them, they, it could look amazing. Yep. But in my head, I'm like, oh, God, so close. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but let me ask you, from a, a design standpoint, what are three in the last, say, 15 years? Let's say let's say 20 years because tw- I don't know. I think of a 20-year-old car and... A 20-year-old car, in my mind, is something from the 1980s, right? Yeah. That's in my mind, even though that's not the case. But in the last 20 years, what are three designs, three cars that have come out from any manufacturer that you've seen them be like, that's amazing. Oh, like that, God. they, they, beautiful. And that, it could be a car, it could be a truck. That is a, that is a really good question to put me on the spot with, um, oh my goodness, um, you know, it's, it's hard. <laughs> it, it, it is really hard because, you know, the first thing that comes to mind are supercars, right? Because they're, the proportions of a supercar are always like, oh, man, that's different. You know, uh, you, right. know it's a, you know, Porsche or LaFerrari, you know, just, you know, those they're they're always, you know, like McLaren. I'm always like, what are they doing? You know, it's like the <laughs> that comes out. And, you know, so those are the cars, I think, that that I you know, initially think about our, our supercars, you know, just because yeah. of, and it's hard for me to say which one right. you know, I'm the most emotional about. Um, after the, after our talk, I'll, I'll be like, Oh, that car and that car. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think, I think uh, certainly, you know, I love watching what goes on in the supercar world, just with the aesthetic side of companies trying to have their, their own visual DNA yeah, um, and then you know, put that on a proportion, and as technology and drivetrains start to allow maybe the proportions to change a little bit, it's interesting to see how that's going to continue to evolve as well. Um, yeah. But uh, though that that's definitely a segment that uh, I think is uh, is cool, and and I you know I love you know, I love, I have much respect for all of our competitors because I love to see what they, how they are doing something that is a product that we have and, and mm. our customer bases, you know, sometimes there's overlap, but, um, you know, that's what keeps us competitive too, is, is understanding yeah. uh, what each, each other's doing. Does it, so every now and then when you see a competitor's car and be like, Ooh, son of a bitch, that was a good idea. <laughs> like I, I would have to imagine that does happen where you're like, yeah, oh, man, it, it, Shit. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're we're we're, uh, we're always good. Uh, we're always good for uh, taking photos of something that you know uh, our engineering counterparts are like. No, no, you can't make that, or we can't do that. And I'm like, well, how did they do it? They just came out. <laughs> <laughs> do, Mark, do you think? I mean, now we we have so much technology out there, and it it, it not just mechanic, uh, but electronics in the cars with the screens and everything else, right? And I think there's a certain enthusiast base out there that still likes just pure analog stuff. I know I'm one of those guys, right? The newest thing that I own is 20 years old and I still like big analog dials and I still like, you know, I, I like just simplicity, yeah. right? I, I don't like a thousand screens and I, I don't need a cabin that lit up like a, you know, like Times Square as soon as I get in the car. Sometimes I just want to like, I just want to see a gauge. I remember, I remember I had a sob, an old sob. And they had this button on the dash and it was called the blackout button. And you would hit the button and every single light in the car would go off except the speedometer. That was the only illuminated gauge. Everything else was, 
I don't know why I love that so much, but if I was driving at night, I would hit that the whole day. Just go whoop and black. And I was like, this is the best thing in the world. That is cool. I didn't know. Oh, that. It, yeah. oh, it was, it was great. It was, it was such a fabulous feature. Yeah. Do you, do you think there's a place? Um, and do you think manufacturers will ever do that again to make just a really, really kind of bare bones performance vehicle that speaks to those analog guys? And, yeah, you know, that's, those, the, the, yeah, that's a really, really good question. And and uh, yeah, and I can't help but think of the original Viper, right? You know, that it's that, exactly perfect example. Got back to that that purity, um, you know, and just simplicity, and it, which started with the Cobra, right? That's what that was just all about. That and yep, and um, and, and I I love that too. I, I just love that simplicity, and I think um, that. Technology will always be there now just because of the platforms that, that, you know, the vehicles, no matter what we build, are going to be built around. However, I think that the screen proliferation uh, is going to just keep going, but I think there will be a point for certain types of vehicles where we can get back to the simplicity, but that it's maybe just a single screen that lets the lets the customer maybe cater it to themselves to make it as simple as they want it to be. Um, but as far as, you know, analog, pure analog pieces and that, I think, I think uh, we're, we're going to not see that for a long time. <laughs> yeah. It, I'll tell you, it, it, it kills me. I mean, you know, we, I still, every now and then I'll get press cars, right. And we'll test stuff and whatever the case is. And it's difficult. Because there, there's very few things that I look at nowadays, and I'm like, I want to buy this. Like it speaks to me, and it's like I remember I just, I just had a BMW. I'm not gonna name the model because it annoyed me so much. And they've, they've got this, and I don't care. They can yell at me; it doesn't matter. Um, they have a technology where it's gesture technology, right? Where you, you, you know, you're in the cabin, and then all of a sudden you go like this in front, and the radio goes up, and you go like that, and the radio goes down, and then you do this, and the, you know. They never obviously consulted Italians because like we talk with our hands. And so like the air conditioning is going on and the radio is going up and down. I'm like, And now I'm moving my hands like crazy trying to figure out how to turn the stupid thing off. Like those are things I don't think that like who asked for that? Yeah, and right. you know what I mean? And I, I understand putting tech in a car as like, OK, well, the public is going to love this, to love this stuff. But did they ask the public? Or, or is it more of putting tech in a vehicle for tech's sake? And I'm wondering if, is that something that, like, when the newest and latest and greatest technology she comes out, is that just because you can, you should? Or how difficult is it for you as a designer to pull the reins back and be like, you don't need to do this. Like, this is completely unnecessary. Yeah, that's a, it's a really good point. And, and as you're saying that, you know, I mean, actually thinking to myself, it's like, yeah, what becomes the saturation point for just overload of, of features and gadgets where, you know, I, I've been there too, right? With vehicles to get in and you become so frustrated because there's so much to learn and how intuitive can it possibly be? It's not, you know? And so I, I'm, I'm with you, but yeah, as a, as a designer, you know, and to, to your point, technology and, and that user interface design, we have a whole department dedicated to that these days because yeah. It is such a big piece of, of the interior and, and the function of a vehicle. And, you know, with technology and, you know, there's a lot of competitors out there that, you know, how simple can you make just one screen? And you got to dig through to find what right. you want and all those hard buttons are gone. And it's certainly efficient for a, a, a auto manufacturer to get rid of all hard buttons and just have it all buried in there because it's cheaper. Um, uh, is it that much cheaper to do it that way? Yeah, you know, really? You about, yeah, you think about the manufacturing of, you know, all the different buttons and switches that you have all over the instrument panel. Now you have complexity in a plant that goes along with it because now, you know, you have these these switch banks and that. If you just have a screen and it's all in there, that's one screen, you know? And so there's a there is a, an efficiency that comes huh. with that. But the the but the interesting side of it to your point is how do you not frustrate a customer? How do you keep it yeah. simple in, in that? So, and that's something that we look at very closely on every vehicle we do based off of how the customer is going to want to use it for sure. You know? Gotcha. Okay. I didn't, I didn't even, I didn't even think of that. 
yeah. for some reason, the idea of putting these screens in and using those interfaces and everything, in my mind, I don't know why, is just more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Because, but I get, I, I guess you're right. If it's if it's one solid state piece of kit that, that goes in there, exactly, exactly, and that controls everything. You don't have to worry about switches and buttons, and so yeah, it's. Uh, and it's a balance because not everyone wants that. Not everyone wants to dig through and find it. And you know, yeah. how do you make things as efficient as you can. And it's it's that whole um, user interface, uh, user experience design piece is a design problem in itself. And and you know you have right. graphics, and then you have colors, and then you have you know what are the things that are that you want dominant? What are things that cost, you know, you want to turn your radio down quick or you want to, you know, turn your HVAC up or down. How do you make those things, right? you know, the, the quickies to get to, you know? So it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a big design issue. And I, I shouldn't say issue, it's problem solving, right? How do, you, sure. how, do you, how do you make it like your phone that you just showed, you know? Yeah. Well, that that's the thing, you know, and, it, and it's, it's interesting because like I said, my, my newest vehicles are, are 20 years old. And like, I know in my old, I have an old Grand Cherokee that I absolutely adore. I mean, this thing, it's just a bomb proof. I love it, <laughs> but it's easy, right? Yeah. Like I, I can literally close my eyes and go AC, radio, yeah. boom, boom, <laughs> boom, boom. And it's, it's the most intuitive thing. Now by today's standards, right? It's a Conestoga wagon with a motor in it, right? Right, right. But there is a simplicity and a basicness to it that is... Um, almost mindless which i don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing yeah. but there i like the simplicity i like the concentrating on just driving and and more importantly knowing how to drive like we see drivers now and i'm like oh dear god yeah. like they they don't look they they just don't look yep. like they just they yep. I, when i see them staring at, at a center dash screen or something like this and they don't use a mirror i'm like you're you're gonna kill everybody. Like, you, <laughs> like what do you? Oh, it drives yeah, me insane. Yeah, it drives yeah. me insane. Oh, I um, hear I can relate. I hear you. <laughs> um, so let me ask you this: What is your if you have a, a dream build, right? What is a car for you that you've always wanted to build the way that you've wanted to build it? And it could be new, it could be old. But what is something that you like? You know what? If if I had my way, I, I would build this, and I would. I would build it exactly the way I wanted. What What is your dream car? You know, it's it, that question is the probably the worst to ask to a designer because it changes. I'm always I'm all you know I don't have the money to do what I want to do, right? So it's always it's all it's always dreaming though, and you know there's I've I, you know I've owned so many cars I think and as you have too, just because mm. you know I I I love them. And, you know, it's like, you know, a little ADD action going on. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know bank account's not that big. So, you know, um, but so I, I try and get my fix on some of the ones that, that I, I've worked on that I hold near and dear to my mm -hmm. heart. That, that Those are really special because, man, those are great that there were production cars that I was able to sure. influence heavily. There's, there's still... I still love, you know, um, from us, I still love a Conquest TSI. I always thought it would be cool. Oh, dude. <laughs> God, that's such a great car. Yeah. That car, when that came out with the flared fenders, yes. Yes. and dude, and the yes. concave deep dish wheels, I remember the first time I saw that because it was the Conquest and it was the Starion. Yes. And I remember yes. looking at that and being like, what in God's name is that thing? Yes. Yes. I am shocked that those cars. Wow, now I'm going to go off on a stupid tangent. I am shocked that those cars don't have a bigger following. And, and I know they didn't make that many of them, but by today's standards, that is such a good-looking automobile. Oh, oh, my God. And you nailed it. The deep wheel on it, it was like, oh, my gosh, that car was so cool. And and somebody, I, I was like, oh, it would be cool to put like a 392 or a Hellcat in it or something. Somebody at SEMA a few years ago did something similar. The red them. one. The, yeah, they put yes. a small block in it. I yes. saw it. Yes. That's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, that, that was one of those cards where I was like, oh, man, I want to do that, but I want to do it, do it a little different. But that's one that is always floating around my head. Like, I would love to build one of those because it probably wouldn't cost that much. But uh, and, yeah. and you know, the, the other car, and I think I remember actually having this conversation with you in, in um, maybe it was D.C., at a, at a Dodge event, 
But, you know, my era of growing up, I've always had this affection for Fox body Mustangs and Capris and that. And, and I yep. still, I, I still think it would be cool to get one of those and do just like what we were talking about, just modernize it a little bit, you know, and uh, just yep. speak in tune, make it sit right. Um, that, that's another one that I, I've always thought would be cool to do too. That was my, my first car was an 81 Fox Capri. That was my first, which I promptly totaled. Um, <laughs> but like, yeah, you know, it's interesting. I look at those cars and, and there's a, there's a pureness to them, right? Yeah. That is just really, really beautiful. And you don't, the, the fact of the matter is you don't have to do a lot to make them, to make them really good. You just, yeah. you just don't. I think people think that you have to spend a billion dollars. You can change subtle things and really make them into great drivers um, from both a comfort and performance perspective. And like, like, no, don't think you're going to take a Fox body and go out and it, you know, with $20,000 transform it into a 911, not yeah. happening, right? Just not right. happening. Right. Right. But you could put your spin on it and make it into a wonderful driver. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know, exactly. Exactly. You, you know, you mentioned the Capri. I had a Capri when I was younger as well. It was a, my first car, hand me down first car, repainted it black and yep. put it up a big wheel on it which which i think was a 15 or a 16 <laughs> remember but it was a big deal i remember yeah. that. but the wheel flares you, know, you talk about the wheel flares and it had kind of the That's mini right. version of you know which porsche 944 you know obviously yep. started but but they all had that kind of cool flair to it as well <laughs> see this is the problem when i talk to you because now i'm gonna get off this podcast i'm gonna be like shit and i'm gonna go directly to like like Hemmings has a classified section. I'm going to go there and I'm looking Conquest TSIs. Then I'm going to look up for like Capri RSs because they're about 30% cheaper than Mustangs, yes. right? Yep. I'm going to look at those and I'm going to, you know, and then my wife's going to be like, what are you doing? Like, what, are you, what are you doing? And I'd be like, I can't help it. I spoke to Mark, yell at him. Oh, God. I love it. I love it. Oh, amazing. Well, Mark, we're coming up on an hour. It is, you know, it is always such a pleasure to, to talk to you. And are you, let me ask you this. Are you going to roadkill nights? Oh yeah. I'll be a roadkill. Right. Yeah. Good. I'll be a road Cause kill. Yeah. I plan on, I'm heading out there this year, which is going to awesome. be great. Um, very awesome. much looking forward to that. Good. We got and out. then um, what else? SEMA, obviously I'll be there. In fact, we're, we're doing Hemmings is doing a build in conjunction with Dodge on a Durango um, that I think you'll dig when you see that um, that's going to be fun. Cool. Um, but yeah, otherwise, man, it's just, it's just always such a pleasure. It really, it really, truly is. Absolutely. I love talking cars and especially with you, there's a, you know, there's a passion, I think that, you know, we have for the automobile and it, it comes through then and what we do and, and, uh, it's, it's actually motivating. And so I, I, I always enjoy talking to you. Thanks for have, having me on. Really appreciate it. Uh, that's great. Well, hang out after the podcast. Cause I got to ask you a few more questions, but otherwise, ladies and gentlemen, that is another episode of the Hemmings Hot Rod Pop uh, Barbecue Podcast. As always, if you are looking for that collectible car, we've got classified section with twenty five to 30,000 cars. We've also got a kick-ass auction. So go check it out. Buy or sell whatever you want. Take uh, inspiration from Mark Trossel and design your perfect car out of something old and collectible. So that's it, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening, folks. And again, please subscribe to the Hot Rod Barbecue Podcast. If you're on Spotify, check us out there. Subscribe to it on iTunes. And if you are going to go to YouTube, make sure you go to the Hot Rod Barbecue Podcast and uh, hit that subscribe button and we'll come to you every week.